So if I didn't come up, would you guys just sit there in silence? You can talk to each other. You can pray for one another. Okay, so uh, elementary school, you guys are dismissed. Uh, junior high and high school, guess what? Pastor Chris is not with us today, so you are in with us today. God bless you guys. If you're visiting uh, today, we're super glad to have you. Uh, you've come on quite a strategic day. Um, I'll just say that if you know the Lord, you'll be comforted and encouraged. And if you don't know the Lord, you could have the hell scared out of you today, literally. So anyway, we're glad to have you here. Um, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 16 this morning, so you can go ahead and uh, be turning there. And while you're doing that, again, I'll just reiterate a couple things that Susie so perfectly said. Do stay today and uh, join us out on the patio afterward. I think um, they've made up just a little kind of a walking taco casserole thing that we're just going to all enjoy uh, together. So I'd uh, love to have you hang out for that. The small groups, um, as Susie said, there's a morning group for men and, a, and an evening group for men and the same morning group for the women and an evening group for the women. So we hope you'll find a time that works for you in your schedule. Uh, right now, those groups will all just be virtual. So you can just pop open. I know it's just one more Zoom meeting in your day. And yet right now it seems uh, appropriate. If there's a big demand uh, for in-person meetings, then we'll go ahead and start those out. But most people, it seems, would be comfortable enough uh, just doing it online. Um, and I want to explain a little bit about the 30 Days to Understanding the Bible book. Um, if you have been with us a while, you may have taken this two plus years ago. Um, it's a great book. It is 30 Days to Understanding the Bible in 15 Minutes a Day. And what it does is it's a book that you get and you work through it at home, sort of 15 minutes each, 15 minutes each day. And it takes you through the basic layout of the Bible, some of the main themes that you're going to find in the Bible. It helps you in terms of chronology within the Bible. Um, it's really, really effective. And then we get together each week on Sundays um, just for a half hour, kind of back in the back in the fellowship hall, just as an opportunity to kind of talk through the different things that the Lord showed you as you were doing your work during the week. So you could do the thing with us and never show up to the meetings, uh, which I would recommend if you're not able to come to the meetings. But coming to the meetings, I think, is really encouraging just because you get to see that the way that the Lord is using the book and using the material and speaking to other people. Uh, and I hope that the people who took the class a couple years ago would be able to uh, just attest to the fact that it really does help just give you that kind of 20,000 foot view of the scriptures. Uh, you know, the only difficulty, I think, with going through the scriptures like we do, verse by verse and chapter by chapter and book by book, is if you're not careful, you can kind of, uh, you know, lose sight of the forest for the trees, as it were. And so this is a great opportunity, again, just to look at things uh, just from that kind of a higher altitude. And um, anyway, enough of a commercial for that class. But that doesn't start out till, uh, till October. So we'll do that during the five Sundays in October. So anyway, we have a big text in front of us today. We're going to celebrate communion at the end of our text, which by the time we get to the end of our text, we are going to need to celebrate communion together. So let's pray and just ask that the Lord would, uh, would especially bless his word uh, this morning. So Father, we thank you so much, uh, Lord, just for the, um, just this place that you have provided, Lord, and this, this time that you have set aside where we can come together each week as your children, Lord, where we can encourage one another, Lord, where we can be encouraged by you, Lord, and we pray that you would do that uh, even now this morning. Lord, we pray for your word as it goes forth. We pray that the, the teaching ministry, Lord, of your Holy Spirit would be manifest here today, Lord, and that he would be the one that would lead us and would guide us into truth. And so, Lord, we pray as we do each and every week that you'd give us ears to hear what he would say to your church this morning. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible, you're going to want a Bible uh, today. Well, you're going to want a Bible every day, but you're going to really want one today because it's sort of a complicated text that we're going to be working through. Uh, raise your hand if you need to borrow a Bible. We've got Bibles and one of the guys can get you one. Of course, you've all got 
a thousand Bibles on your phone, so that would, uh, that would work too. But. So for chapter after chapter, right, chapters 10 through 15, it's kind of started to feel in the text a little bit like a hot Midwestern summer's day, right? It's starting to feel like thunderstorm weather. And as we've been in this sort of, you know, parenthetical passage, it's starting to feel there's kind of a stillness in the air. It's been like this quiet, kind of an ominous calm before the storm that we all knew is coming, right? All the clouds have kind of now moved into place. We've heard kind of some rumblings, right? Not too much to give things away, and yet enough to know that the coming storm is going to be a big one. Remember in chapter 14, we had that angel of warning that, that flew throughout the sky across the face of the earth, warning people, right? Don't bow down to the beast. Don't take the image or the mark of the beast, right? Then we had another angel which came out and announced the, the coming fall of Babylon the Great. And then in chapter 15 last week, we saw the final preparations for the bowl judgments. Again, the bowl judgments, the final set of these three sets of judgments that God's going to pour out on the earth during this time. And we watched last week at what we called this pause of preparation in heaven, right? A pause of preparing in heaven for the actions that were about to come down upon the earth. And we saw that it was very much, it was a pause with a purpose, and the purpose was to remind us before we get started that God's dealings in bringing these judgments, his dealings are indeed right and they are just. And so the tension has sort of been mounting. These chapters have been full of kind of a sense of dread of what's coming. And now the time has come this morning for the storm to officially break. The time has come this morning for that, what we talked about last week, that settled wrath of God to now flash fast, right? And it's going to flash hot in these verses of chapter 16. So chapter 16 is the pouring out of the bowls of the great wrath of God. And yet we're going to see that in God's mercy, the storm is going to be short and best of all, this, this storm is going to leave the skies clear for the next thousand years. So chronologically, this chapter is very close to the end, right? Very close to that time of the second coming of Jesus. We're going to see that these judgments, once they start to fall, they start to fall in very rapid succession. We're going to see that they're aimed specifically at the, the beast, at Satan, at the kingdom of the beast. And we're going to see that they ultimately prepare the way for that final battle of human history, Armageddon. They prepare the way for the return of Jesus to the earth to claim his kingdom. And so John writes, beginning in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 16, he said, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Now this verse is super interesting just in and of itself. So before we move on, remember at the close of the last chapter, Remember we saw that the glory of God mixed with that smoke of judgment. It filled the heavenly sanctuary. In the last verse of our, last, our text last time in Revelation 15, 8, it said that the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So remember, we talked about, you know, effectively that the doors of the heavenly temple were shut, right? slammed shut. No one could come in, no one could go out, which simply said means that God was left alone in the temple, right? All by himself, which then tells us that this voice that comes now from inside the temple is nothing less than the very voice of God himself, 
right? It says it's a, a loud voice, right? Giving this command now to the angels. We said those are the, his agents of judgment. Giving this command to the angels to carry out the judgment. Again, it's just a simple reminder, but it's important to remember that God is in control, right? That all of these judgments come from him. They come from his holy throne. And it's interesting, the adjective there that's translated loud, right? It's a Greek word, I'll pronounce it improperly, um, megales, right? It's where we get our English word mega. And it's very frequently used over and over in this chapter, but it's used in connection with all kinds of different things. We see they're going to talk about great heat, the great river, the great day of God Almighty, a great earthquake, great hailstones, a great plague. And so this word mega, right, it has the sense not just of being big or of being great, but really of being the great est, really of being the big Est, because the judgments that are going to be poured out here, though we're going to see that some of their targets are very similar to what we saw in the trumpet judgments, these bowl judgments are greater. They are more severe. They are much more intense than any of the judgments that we have seen happen in any of these preceding Events And so this verse, right, this loud voice, this mega voice of God reminds us that he is in charge, right? He is in charge of everything that's going on here on the earth. He's the one that gives the orders. This is his neighborhood, right? This is his world. And although the devil and his wickedness seemingly have hijacked it, Right? He has seemed to take control over it. God himself is about to take that back by releasing this final set of judgments, which ultimately is the only thing that will bring to an end all of the great wickedness. So the command is given to the angels in verse 1. In verse 2, it says, So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth. And a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So this first bowl kind of reminds us of the sixth plague that came upon Egypt. Remember when boils broke out all over the Egyptians. And yet what's interesting here is it seems that it's not a series of sores, but it's a single sore. Right? A foul and loathsome sore that came upon those who worshipped the beast. Now the word loathsome is an interesting one. It comes from an old English word that means troublesome or vexing or uh, annoying. Right, So you get this kind of a picture of some sort of an ulcerated kind of an oozing sore right? that breaks out on their bodies, right, very unsightly, and yet that's not the biggest problem, because we're going to see later in the text, it's not only unsightly, but it's very, very painful. And it only came to those who had taken the mark, though they had been warned not to do so. And some have suggested, I think very plausibly, that perhaps whatever it is that will be used to apply the mark Right? Whether maybe it's a microchip that's implanted into the skin on the forehead or, or in the hand, that that microchip itself will somehow turn into some kind of a cancerous sore, right? An oozing, loathsome, ugly, disfiguring blotch, right? Talk about a mark that would be there on your face or on your hand. And when you think about it, this judgment is absolutely right and it's absolutely fitting because in it what God is doing is he is merely now showing in an outward sense what is really already true in an inward sense. That these people who have taken the mark are morally, spiritually, practically, they are ulcers, they are poisons, they are the cancer really to the earth. 
Right? There's nothing beautiful about these people, no matter how successful or beautiful or fashionable they may look as they sort of follow after the crowd here. And so what God's doing is he's simply exposing them. He's saying, look, let's make you look on the outside the way that I know that you are on the inside. And all I can say this morning is, aren't you glad that the Lord doesn't do that with each of us this morning? Amen? Right? Aren't you glad he doesn't make our outward appearance look like we know our hearts sometimes look? Now, if he did, that would definitely promote Bible reading, wouldn't it? Again, because it's that reading of the Bible. It's us spending time in his word. That's what washes our hearts. It's what cleanses our hearts. It's what makes our hearts pure and what makes our hearts beautiful. Notice again, the sore only comes to those who took the mark, right? And again, maybe even from the mark itself. And I think that that reminds us that here, even now, as we see this white hot wrath of God start to be poured out, it's a reminder that even at this point, his wrath is measured and it's targeted and it is controlled. It's very purposeful. It's very, very deliberate. God is very careful at how it is that he's pouring out his judgment. He's not like some crazy person throwing a fit out of control. It's not like, wow, dad's lost his temper again. Get out of the house. It's not that at all. His wrath is, is incredibly measured, at least here in this first bowl, right? This loathsome sore, specifically only those who took the mark of the beast. But now we're going to see the scope is going to widen and become more worldwide. Look at the second and third bowls in verses 3 and 4. We're going to see the whole world water system turned to blood. It says in verse 3 that then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. So the second two bowls poured out here in these two verses. The second bowl turns the sea to blood. The third bowl, it says, turns all of the springs and the rivers, right? So you've got the salt water turned to blood, the fresh water as well turned to blood. And again, this isn't at all unprecedented in human history, is it? Because we're reminded of the very first plague that Egypt experienced. Remember when the Nile River turned to blood. It also reminds us of the second trumpet. Remember back in chapter 8, but remember that during that specific trumpet judgment, we remember that only a third of the sea became blood. And here we see what we believe is the entire water system of the world polluted. Every ocean, every lake, every river, every spring, every well, every faucet, every garden hose, every drinking fountain, completely, utterly unusable to sustain life. And worse yet, clogged up by some sort of almost congealed kind of dead man's blood, right? Like a corpse, blood like in a corpse. Now, we don't know exactly what that means, but what I do know is that doesn't sound very good. And it certainly doesn't sound very refreshing to be chugging down on a hot day. Now, what this tells us in this judgment is that when these final judgments come, we must be close to the end. Because with this kind of a global ecological disaster, the human race could not survive very long after this. And I hate to even bring this up, right, especially before we're going to eat, but can you even imagine the stink that will come when every body of water on this planet has been turned to blood? Congealed, rotting blood. Have you ever smelled dead blood? 
So this kind of, a, we're getting a sense of a scene that's almost unimaginable. And yet, we look at what happens next, immediately as this, these bodies are turned to blood, look at what heaven says in response to this. Look at verses 5 and 6. It says, And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to, uh, to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. Right? So according to the scales of heaven, right, even this kind of unimaginable judgment is absolutely righteous. The people of the earth right, have shed the blood of God's people, of the saints and the prophets, so now God gives them blood to drink. He says, look, you like to shed blood? Well, then you're going to drink blood. Right? I'll give you what you love so much. I'm going to give you your fill of blood. And again, it is so perfect a judgment because they are simply reaping exactly what they've sown. We think about Pharaoh, you know, who drowned all the Hebrew baby boys. And so his whole army was then drowned in the Red Sea. We think about Haman who built a gallows to hang Mordecai in the book of Esther. And yet at the end of the story, it was Haman and his sons who were hanged from that very gallows instead. And it's a reminder for us that justice is pure and it's righteous in heaven, right? It's the victims who have the greater voice for justice. It's not the ones who meet out the crime and who meet out the violence, right? So the voice of the angel comes here crying out on behalf of the martyrs. But look at verse 7. It's not only an angel who cries out. It says in verse 7, And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So not only does the angel of the waters cry out, but the altar itself cries out as well. And this is an especially interesting verse because in actuality, that phrase, another from, doesn't actually appear in the original Greek text. And so depending on what translation you're using, some of the newer translations like the NIV or the ESV or the NASB, if you use that one, more correctly, they will render this verse that John says, and I heard the altar say. Now, we don't know if this is figurative, right, this voice, or it could be literal, right? We can't really say for sure, but what we can say for sure is that the heavenly altar, right, this place of sacrifice, in some way, it itself testifies to the righteous judgments of God. And it's interesting when you think about it, because what we know about the heavenly altar is there is no longer any need for a daily sacrifice in heaven today for sin. Why? Because that need was satisfied where? At the cross. The need for the daily sacrifice was satisfied at the cross by the Lamb of God whose once for all sacrifice on that altar took the sin of the world because the cross in a very real sense is the heavenly altar. And it cries out that God's judgments are right and that God's judgments are true and that they are just. Peter writes in his first letter that Christ also suffered once for sins. He says the just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh. But made alive by the spirit. So the transaction was equal, right? The life of the just was given so that the unjust could be set free. And so like nothing else, it's the cross the ultimate altar, that's what speaks perfectly of God's righteousness and of his justments, justice. But it also speaks more powerfully, doesn't it, of his grace. His grace on behalf of any of us who have received it. 
And I think that this is so important for us because it's in our own times of trial and in our own times of tribulation, if you will, that we can fall into that trap. We all have that tendency to start to question the fairness of the Father. And yet when we look at the altar, right, when we look at the cross, we look at that ultimate place of sacrifice, it tells us just the opposite. What it tells us is that God demonstrated his love for you in that while you were yet sinner, Christ died for you. But if we don't see this, right, if we don't have this in our mind, then we can easily go through life one day blessing the Lord because he's blessing us. And the next day we're cursing him because we're in some kind of a trial. And so it's it's the lens of God's love demonstrated at the cross of Calvary, right, the altar of Calvary, if you will. That's what we need to look at every time we face a trial, through every hard time that we endure, right? That's why Paul could write in Romans chapter eight, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? We all know that part. But then here's his justification for that. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So because God loved me enough to hang on the cross in my place to pay for my sin and to die for me, because I know that, I also know that everything he does in my life, everything he allows into my life, whether I understand it or not at the time, but I know that it's just and I know that it's right because the altar, right, the cross declares that to be true. And I hate to say this because I don't want to make light of it, and yet I'm going to say it because I hope you'll remember it. But what we need to do is always let the cross alter our perspective on our trials and struggles. Right? Look at everything that happens to us, everything that comes to us. We need to look at it in the light of Calvary. So here in these second and third bowls, right, we have all of these earth dwellers who rejected the testimony of the martyrs. They spilled their blood in just the same way that so many years ago, these same earth dwellers rejected the love of Jesus. They spilled his blood on Calvary, right? And the price of rejecting God's grace, rejecting his priceless gift of Jesus it comes with a very high price tag, both here and also even more so in eternity for eternity. Look what the, it's pictured next for us. Look at the fourth and fifth bowls, right? In verses eight and nine, it says that then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. So the judgment here of this fourth angel, and then we're going to see the fifth, they involve the heavens, right? This first bowl allows the, causes the sun to scorch men. Now, this could easily be the result of some sort of a supernova, right, that the sun goes through, right? A supernova, that that stage that immediately precedes the death of a star where it suddenly becomes intensely hot. And when this happens to the sun, the results on earth are intense. Scorched is a pretty strong word, isn't it? Scorched with fire... (laughs) That's even stronger. And scorched with great heat, which is literally scorched with mega heat. That's even stronger. So what's happening here is way worse than your worst sunburn. Right? Does everybody here remember their worst sunburn? I can tell you as a fair-skinned Irish kid... I had some sunburns that landed me in the emergency room with third-degree burns 
more than one time. I have always been a little bit of a slow learner, right? But if you think back to your worst sunburn, this is way worse than that possibly was, blisters and all. But again, what's God doing here to these people, right? To these rebellious people, he is so just, he's so merciful, he is giving them a foretaste of hell. And then just as quickly, right, just as quickly as the sun had flashed hot and scorched men with fire, it says in verse 10, then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. So after the sun experiences maybe some sort of a, you know, a, a supernova or something, the world is next plunged into darkness. Now, it's possible, and Bible students disagree, it's possible that this darkness covered just the immediate kingdom of the beast, right? Right around where his throne literally was located, which we're going to see will be the rebuilt city of Babylon. But I believe, along with some students, that it's much more likely that this is a worldwide darkness at this point. Because the kingdom of the beast at this point is worldwide. The kingdom of the beach is world, beast is worldwide in its reach. The entire world is under the sway of the wicked one. All of the world is his kingdom. Imagine the agony of the people on the earth at this point. They've got skin burned that's scorched by the sun. They've got this loathsome sore on their foreheads that just will not heal. Now they have to endure this unspeakable pain in darkness. But once again, the justice is perfect, right? You look, you want to follow Satan, the prince of darkness? You want to follow the Antichrist who's trying to usher in darkness, bringing darkness to the world? God says, you want darkness? Okay, I'll give you darkness. What I think is really fascinating in these first five bowls, right? We've got sores and drinking bloody water in the dark with skin that's scorched by the sun. It's almost as if God looked down from heaven at mankind at this point. And in essence, he says, okay. I am no longer going to provide men with good health and fresh drinking water and beautiful sunshine in which they can just continue their rebellion against me. So I'm going to take away all of the good things that I'm providing them with. If they won't acknowledge that these things are from me, then I'm going to take these things from them. And he does it. And he's free to do it. Now, of course, this darkness is just like the ninth plague of ten plagues that we saw come upon Egypt as they're kind of increasing in their intensity. And remember, when we read of that plague that came upon Egypt, in Exodus chapter 10, it said that it was a darkness which may even be felt. Have you ever been in a place that's so dark that you could feel the darkness? And there was one particular study done a long time ago, and I'm sure there have been many since, that said that if you put a human being in an absolutely pitch black place, with no degree of light of any kind coming into that room, that they will go mad in a surprisingly short period of time. Then you add some ulcerated sores from the scorching sun and you add that to the darkness and you have such a situation of torment that it says there in this verse that they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. And again, what's happening here? Well, it's a perfect foretaste of hell. Remember when Jesus referred to hell as outer darkness and he said that there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And yet, here's what I want us to understand, is that for all of its horror, at least where these people are at this point during the tribulation, they are still alive, and they still, so it would seem, they still have the opportunity to repent. 
Their situation is still temporal, and yet what we read tragically is that the response in verse 11, it says that they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Now this is amazing to me, that here it would seem from this verse that there is still here at the 11th hour of all of human history, there is still somehow the possibility for people to turn from their rebellion against God and to turn back to him. And yet, they will not. All of this affliction didn't soften their hearts, but instead it's hardened their hearts. Rather than repent, they blaspheme God, and notice in the text, they blame him for their pains and their sores, right? All of this pain and this hurt, it brings about this incredible hate all around the world. Imagine this, we've got thousands of languages, we've got even more different dialects as each person individually is going to be shouting at heaven, kind of collectively, just shaking their fists at God in one long, shrieking blasphemy and curse. And as they do it, they are just heaping this judgment down upon themselves because this is an issue of personal responsibility. Notice God is giving them an opportunity to repent. And if in fact they do not repent, that's their decision. And they will bear individually the consequences of that. And yet they also bear collectively the responsibility of these, the continuation of the judgment that's coming, right? They are responsible for what's happening here because they did not repent at all. And you just think about that. You think about a person who is so determined to live a life of sin. Right? Whatever sin it is that they have attached themselves to, it might be a hundred different sins, right? But all of those sins are simply rebellion against God. But you have a person who loves their sins so much that even this kind of affliction will not move them away from their sin. It's insanity. And yet, it's exactly the place that they are in. They say, I don't care what God does to me. I am not moving away from this sin. And so they are forcing God's hand. They're forcing him to raise up. Because with that kind of people who are in rebellion against God, when they are dug in like that, we've said it before, either they are going to win, right, and their vision for the earth is going to unfold, or God is going to win. And his vision for what he wants the earth to be is going to unfold. But they both can't win, right? And God is, is way too wise and he's too righteous and he is too loving to allow those people to win. And so he makes sure through these judgments to bring an end to their sin and their wickedness and their rebellion. And all the while, Understand that all the while, while this is all happening, this wonderful beast that they have been worshiping and exalting as their God, he is going to be completely powerless to help them. You know, when you look at the plagues that God poured out on Egypt, the more you look at them, the more you understand that they were not in any way arbitrary or random. But they were very carefully chosen. They were strategically selected by God in his wisdom, each and every one of the plagues, to expose each of the false gods that Egypt was worshiping and to expose them as absolutely powerless. And in the very same way, these bowls of wrath that are being poured out here on the earth are going to expose the devil and the antichrist and the false prophet as being powerless to stop any of it. God is communicating to the world that the antichrist, who they are worshiping as God, that he is not God. 
that there is a God that is greater than him, right? The devil is not God. The false prophet is not God. Don't continue to follow after them and don't continue to submit your lives to them, but instead seek after the one who's able to judge them because they are powerless to stop it. And when you think about it, you would just, like, you would think that in the midst of all of this, that people would see all of this that's happening around them and they would take a turn and they'd say, wow, I think I might be on the wrong path. Right? You know, why am I worshiping this Antichrist who can't seem to stop this? There must be a bigger God. Right? There must be a mega God. We know that they know that there is a God because they're shaking their fist at him and they know that he's the one sending the plagues and yet they won't turn and worship him. It's absolutely amazing. And God is still trying to get through to these people. He is trying to get them to see the beast for who he is because now the very throne of the beast and the kingdom and the dominion of the beast is under direct attack from heaven and the beast knows it. The Antichrist knows it and so we're going to see it will not take him long to react. But first we see the sixth bull, God preparing the way for the end. It says in verse 12 that then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Now the Euphrates River is this natural dividing line between the Middle East and the Far East. And it's 1,800 miles long. It's an average of 30 feet deep. It's anywhere between 300 feet and 3,600 feet wide at points. It is a great River. It's actually a mega river. Right? It has long served as a very natural barrier for any kind of force that would invade from the east. That phrase, kings from the east, is literally kings of the rising sun in the original text. And of course, the land of the rising sun, right, historically, traditionally, refers to both Japan and China. So now we start to see some of these prophecies continuing to come into place. You take the advanced technology of Japan and just the sheer manpower of China and you very easily could produce a 200 million man army like we saw prophesied back in chapter nine that would be part of this final world battle. Now again, you know me, I don't want to get too political, but it is interesting, isn't it, as we've watched the economies of the East have been steadily on the rise. And though the United States is still rated as the largest economy on the planet, we think about the trade deficit that we have related to China. We think about the amount of U.S. dollars that Asia holds and the potential that they have for the disrupting of the entire American economy. Where is it that we see the rising economies of the world? Well, the growing economies of the world, of course, are in China and they are Japan, Vietnam, Cambodia, South Korea, and especially India. And what we see is we see the entire world economy starting to recenter itself and kind of move in that direction in the world to the east. Because it takes a lot of money to be able to field the kind of armies and to be able to produce the kind of military might that the Bible says that they are going to be able to produce in these last days. And so we look at what's happening and we see that the economies are developing where they're developing for just that purpose as God prepares the world for this final conflict in human history. You know, thinking about the Euphrates, it, it, it's interesting, isn't it, that God delivered Israel from the bondage of Egypt by drying up the Red Sea and now he's going to deliver, uh, he's going to dry up the river Euphrates now to prepare the way for these armies of the east to come 
over to meet with all of the other armies of the world at Armageddon. Look at what John sees next. So now this is kind of one of these little pauses between the sixth and the seventh bowl judgment, just like we've seen in all the others. Look at verse 13. John says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. So the stage is now set, right? All of the pieces, all of the players have been assembled for what will be man's last stand, if you will, in his rebellion against God. Now, from a human viewpoint, it's going to appear as though the armies of the nations are gathering on their own. And yet John makes it clear here that all of this military movement is spiritually induced. It's all allowed by God as a part of his plan. John gives us this glimpse into the realm of the spirit where we see the real forces that are at work in this final movement of men. It's the satanic trinity again, right? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Through their demonic powers, they unleash these unclean spirits, again, likened to frogs, right? Kind of leaping out of their mouths, right? influencing rulers to assemble their armies, right? Kind of croaking in their ears, right? Continuously, repeat as, like, you know, go to Megiddo, go to Megiddo, go to Megiddo, right? World rulers, high-ranking military officials are all going to be under the sway of these demonic forces. And yet they will be thinking that they are making the decisions but all the while, they are just doing the will of Satan himself. Think about it. The most powerful men in the world at the time, and they have no defense over this influence. Because what the Bible teaches us is that until Jesus Christ is in our hearts, that we are completely vulnerable to being deceived and even being controlled by the lies of the devil. It is only as we have Jesus in our lives that we have any kind of a protection against that kind of an overwhelming influence. Right? John tells us in his first letter that you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you, the Holy Spirit, is greater than he who is in the world, right? These demonic spirits. And yet even as believers, we still need to choose each and every day which voices we're listening to. But we have more than a fighting chance and we have more than the power that we need. So here, all these armies are going to gather, they think, to attack the Antichrist in the hopes of taking away some of what will at the time be sort of his crumbling political power. What they don't understand is that it's the Antichrist himself that has lured them there, right? Because he wants them to combine forces and to fight against Jesus Christ because Satan knows well that Jesus is going to return right during this final battle. When he does return, of course, he's going to defeat them all in an instant. Just a stop on his way to touch down on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, right? That final conflict, we see it here in verse 16, is going to take place, it says, where? At Armageddon. Now, I think we talked about this last week. All the weeks kind of blend together a little bit, don't they? But the name Armageddon comes from two different Hebrew words. Har, meaning hill or mountain, and then Megiddo or Megiddon, which means it's an ancient city and it's a place that means, uh, it's a name that means the place of troops or place of slaughter. 
It's an area also called the Plain of Esdralon. It's called the Valley of Jezreel. And the whole area, it's about 14 miles wide. It's 20 miles long. And it forms what Napoleon called, he called it the most natural battlefield of the whole earth. And of course, it will be the final battlefield of the whole earth. But notice that as these preparations are beginning for this battle, what do we find in verse 15? It's almost like another one of these many little parenthetical passages. Verse 15 is a promise from Jesus to believers who were on the earth at the time to say, hey, when you start to see these things, I am coming soon. I am coming quickly. It will not be long now. Just hang on. And he says, stay pure. Right? Stay pure in the midst of all of this wickedness. He says, stay robed in my righteousness. In just the same way that Paul tells us as Christians today in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we shouldn't be surprised by the rapture of the church. So the believers on earth at the time of the second coming they should be anxiously anticipating the return of Jesus, especially as they see these things start to come to pass. The unbelievers will be surprised. And yet, these believers, they should be anxiously awaiting the return of their king, which will come finally here as part of the seventh bowl. Look at verses 17 through 21. It says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. So just like Jesus cried out what? It is finished from the cross. Here the father now shouts out with his mega voice. He cries out, it is finished from the throne of heaven. Verse 18, it says, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So great Babylon is finally fallen, and all of the power of Satan that was behind it. Look back quickly at verse 17, and notice that when the final angel pours out his bowl, notice he doesn't pour it out on the earth. Where does he pour it? He pours it into the air because this is the realm which Satan has long controlled. Paul calls him in Ephesians chapter 2 the prince of the power of what? The air. All of these judgments so far have touched the world of nature and they've touched the world of mankind but they haven't yet touched kind of the mastermind behind all of this destruction and that's Satan. And here, his kingdom and he himself are finally fallen. Now, starting next week, John's going to kind of rewind the tape a little bit. And he's going to expand on this seventh bowl. He's going to detail for us the final destruction during the seventh bowl of Satan's religious system in chapter 17, his political system in chapter 18, of his armies in chapter 19, and then finally in chapter 20, we're going to see the destruction of that old serpent himself. For now... As part of what we have in chapter 16, we see this description of this great earthquake where John says that such a mighty and uh, what? Mega earthquake, he says, had never happened since men were on the earth. And just imagine that statement because the world has known some pretty great earthquakes, hasn't it? Remember just back in our recent past, remember that, that tsunami in Sumatra that was caused by an offshore earthquake that registered between 9.1 and 9.3 on the Richter scale. 
Now, just for reference, remember our Loma Prieta quake was only 6.9. And if you lived through it like I did, that seemed about big enough, didn't it? But this one, the Sumatra quake, was 2,000 times stronger than our quake. As geologists calculate in terms of the, just the energy that was re released. And the Sumatra quake was only the third largest quake that was ever recorded, but it had the longest duration. Do you know that that earthquake lasted between eight and 10 minutes? Can you imagine that kind of shaking for that kind of duration in time? And you remember as a result of it, there was a whole kind of a geological ledge that broke down under the water and that's what unleashed the tsunami which created these 30 foot waves that killed 230,000 people in 14 different countries. And it actually affected the orbit of the planet. You talk about the force. We're talking about an earthquake that will make that pale in comparison. And geologists are well aware of a very well-mapped system of faults and rifts that run all across our entire planet, right? Of course, we know that the entire west coast of the Americas, from Alaska all the way down to Argentina, as well as the eastern coast of Asia, right? From Siberia all the way down to New Zealand, right? Huge, major fault lines. Another major fault line apparently takes in all of southern Europe, right? The entire coastline of the Mediterranean, and it continues all the way east as it kind of broadens and expands as it moves towards Asia. And you look at a picture like this, and you think, wow, it's almost as though all of these fault lines are precisely prepared for this very coming day. No doubt all of these areas are going to burst wide open, right, at the point that this mega earthquake comes. It's going to destroy every city. It's going to completely change the topography of this entire planet, preparing it for Jesus' millennial kingdom. And then, in our very last verse, for anyone who survived that, it says in verse 21 that great hail from heaven fell upon men. Every hailstone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. So all of this and then hail. And not just any hail, right? What does it say? It's great hail. And you guessed it, it is mega hail. Every one of them weighing about a talent, and a talent is equal to about a hundred pounds. Now, where do you hide from a hailstone that is a hundred pounds? And the answer is you don't hide, right? You can't hide. There's no building strong enough, right? This makes the seventh plague of hail that came upon Egypt look like child's play. You cannot hide from 100 pound hail. The only thing you could do is fall to your knees and finally cry out to God to have mercy on you. And yet that is not at all what we see at all. Instead, what we see is the same people who refuse to repent and give glory to God. In verse 9, it said that they blasphemed the name of God who had power over the plagues. And here, they just continue to blaspheme him even more because of the plagues. Now, we might read this and we might wonder, wow, God, you know, 100-pound hailstones falling on everybody even after everything else that happened. And yet... When we stop and when we consider it, once again, this is the perfect righteous judgment. Because, Bible students, right, what was the Old Testament penalty for blaspheming God? It was stoning. It was death by stoning. And the whole world at this point is more than guilty of blaspheming God. 
And so once again, he simply takes his holy righteous law and he lays it alongside, he applies it to their sin. And yet what does it say they do? They continue to blame him for it. It's astounding to me this chapter is. And I am as astounded by the reaction of mankind as I am by all of the you know, fantastic or the incredible judgment that God pours out. The Lord said this to Jeremiah. He said that the heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Then he says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Fair, righteous, just, right? Personal responsibility. None of us here in this room this morning who knows our own wicked hearts, none of us would argue one bit with God's assessment in this statement. And oh, how thankful we are for the cross, right? How thankful we are for the blood of Jesus Christ who cleanses us from all of our sin, right? And I'm so thankful that we get to celebrate communion today, aren't you? I'm so thankful that we get to celebrate communion today in light of this sobering text, right? Because it's a, it's a celebration of our personal deliverance from sin, our personal deliverance from the power of Satan and our own personal deliverance from this wrath of God that we've read about this morning, which every one of us rightly deserves, but for Jesus. But for Jesus and but for the cross of Calvary, right? That ultimate altar that testifies that God's judgments are righteous and they're true. Amen? So we're going to celebrate communion this morning. The kids are going to come back up to lead us uh, in another song for worship. And as they do, again, we have open communion here at Calvary Chapel, which simply means it's open regardless of what church you attend. You don't have to have your membership papers sent over so that we can allow you to take communion. But if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, then communion is for you this morning. And if you're not a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you can still take communion after you give your life to him. So as we start to, to worship, feel free to come forward you can take the elements. We're still using those crazy peel-off little cups just because of uh, concerns over sickness and such. But grab a, a packet of communion supplies and just take them back to your seat and take this as an opportunity just to reflect on all it is that Jesus has done for you. Again, that, that the blood, I mean, the, the juice representing his shed blood for you, the, the cracker, the wafer representing his body broken for you. And if you do need prayer, if you're interested in taking that step and making Jesus the Lord of your life, asking him to come into your life and forgive you of your sins, um, there are going to be people here to my right and to my left. Pastor Jeff and his wife Anne are going to be up this morning. Um, you can come and you can pray with them. They'd be happy to talk to you and kind of lead you through that process and help you understand um, what you're doing. So let's pray and... Uh, just ask the Lord to bless our time of communion. So, Father, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you, Lord, even just for a, a, a sobering text like today, Lord, that, that we might struggle with, Lord, in our understanding. Lord, we're just reminded that, that all along the way, Lord, that we are, we're told, we're reminded that you are just and you are righteous and you are true and that your judgments are right. So Lord, we want to trust you, Lord, as you make these decisions and take these actions with your world, Lord. And we, we're reminded of your great love for us, Lord, through the cross. So we celebrate that this morning, Lord, as we take communion. We ask that you'd help to make 
just the reality of the cross uh, fresh and new in each one of our hearts today, Lord, as we look not just at this terrible seven years of judgment that you're saving us from, Lord, but as we think about the eternity that we're being saved from, Lord, as we think about all of those things even here in this temporal life, Lord, that you've come not to just to give us eternal life, but to give us life here now and to give us life more abundant. And so we thank you for that now, Lord. We ask that you'd bless this time in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So feel free.